Matthew 26, verse 36. Then comes Jesus with them, his disciples, unto a place called Gethsemane, and said unto his disciples, there are three spots that I'm going to emphasize. That's all. Uh, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. It's his first session of prayer. And he did something amazing. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. Why did he pick these three? How did the other disciples felt? As Was Jesus partial? Was Jesus just picking three and leaving the others, the eight of them there? Or nine probably? Why did he pick three? We'll find out. So he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then said he unto them, my soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. I feel like I'm going to die now. Tarry here and watch with me. I need you. And he went a little further. This is where my topic is going to come in from this verse. He went a little further. There is much grounds to cover in Gethsemane. And the further you go on, this is my topic, to rise up higher, as in the resurrection, you must go deeper in Gethsemane. You can't be a shallow believer by just sitting outside Gethsemane, as I will show you, and expect to rise up in the power of the resurrection. To rise up higher, you have to go in deeper. And so, that's my topic. He went in a little further and fell on his face. I would imagine the weight of the problem threw him down and he fell on his face and prayed on the floor saying, Oh, my father, if it be possible, let us come pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will, can you sense the agony in his voice? He comes back unto his disciples, finds them asleep, and said unto Peter, What? Could you not watch with me for one hour? Probably he prayed for the full hour. I don't know. Maybe this is an expression. Can't you watch with me for one hour? Is a one hour prayer meeting too long for some people? And a TV show of three hours is nothing? I ain't start to preach yet. Then. Watch and pray. That you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing. But the flesh is weak. Okay, that's the first round. Let's look at the second round. You know, in the Olympics, when you're boxing in Olympics, you only have three rounds. And this is a kind of Olympic battle here where he had three rounds. And I'm going to mention these three rounds. This is the second round. Verse 42. He went away again the second time and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, that will be done. It's the second time he's saying the same prayer. It became a, and he came and found them asleep again. For their eyes were heavy. And he left them. And went away again. And prayed the third time. Saying the same words. Oh my father. If this cup may not pass away from me. Except I drink it. Thy will be done. Then he came to his disciples. And said unto them. Sleep on now. Take your rest. Because there's a time to pray. And there's a time to rest. And you rest after you've prayed, not before when you need it. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. 
Rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that betrays me. I'll stop there. To rise up higher, go in deeper. We want to go into the three steps. The three furtherments of, of Gethsemane. And I am going to close with this statement that I'm opening with. Better be sanctified in our troubles than be satisfied without them. I'll say that again. Better be sanctified or set apart in our troubles than to be satisfied without them. Jesus was not going to be satisfied until he was sanctified and set himself apart to finish what God had called him. You can throw back up the slide, please. You have to settle the matter here. You can leave this until I ask you to change it. These are some thoughts I'm throwing at you before I get there. Sometimes Jesus prayed three times. It became a principle that Paul used when he was afflicted by the messenger of Satan. He prayed three times. And after praying three times, he quit praying saying, Thy will be done. And so sometimes we kill the subject in prayer. And still get no answer. It is possible that after you have prayed sincerely, earnestly, and surrendered the matter to God, that you just leave the results in his hand. And this, based on that, I'm going to say this. Sometimes, when prayer will not change a situation, you may have to go through it. So you've been praying and praying to escape. And it has not happened. It is probably because God wants you to go through it. And as you go through it, he will give you grace and strength to make it to where he wants to take you. Can I hear an amen? He said, rise. He that betrayed me is a hand. Satan never sends a fool to do his work. So you might be bright and intelligent. You could be a candidate. If you are not submitted to the Lord. The enemy can use anybody. We've seen that with Peter. Jesus had to rebuke him. and said, get behind me, Satan. My chief apostle had to be rebuked. So understand. When Satan is working, some of the smartest people he will use. So let's go into the text now. Verse 36, then comes Jesus with them into a place called Gethsemane, said unto his disciples, sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. That's a very comforting thing for some people. While people are praying, they are sitting. As if prayer is a spectacle to be watched. You see the results. Of sitting and not praying when he asked them to pray. Do are you sitting while others are praying? Are you depending on the prayer of others when you have that gift and that opportunity to pray to the God of heaven for yourself, for your family? He, he, hear what I'm gonna tell you. If we had more praying people who prayed for their families a little longer, a little stronger, and went further in prayer, I think families will experience less problems. I, I truly believe that. The family that prays together stays together. Doesn't mean you wouldn't have troubles, but it means you will have the power that comes from praying to overcome those troubles and let your family be free from the burden of guilt and troubles unnecessary. Now watch this. I'm gonna I'm gonna shift here. He took with him, verse 37, Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, the sons of thunder, the big mouthed ones. Why did he choose them? When he went to pray for Jairus' daughter, he took the three of them and left all the apostles out. How do you think they felt? Marginalized? 
When we bring up people on the platform here as ministers and you will feel left out, you think it's because we want to leave you out? On the Mount of Transfiguration, watch this. I'm going with somewhere with this. He took with him Peter, James, and John. They witnessed his glory. Now these same three, three trusted in a circle buddies who he revealed his glory to, who he showed how to raise the dead, training them. He took these three with him. And they fell asleep. Listen to what I'm going to say, and it may not make sense, but to me it does. See, Gethsemane is not shallow. It's, it's with deep people. Those, there are times when people will share your glory. There are times people will be happy for you. When you have money and you could buy them lunch, they'll love you. But there are times these same people, when you're going through your struggle, when you need them to intercede for you, then just might not be there. So what you have to learn to do is not depend on your friend's prayer. Not depend on your inner circle prayer. You have to have a prayer life of your own. Because if you don't know how to pray for yourself, others will not take you through. You got to pray through. You got to pray through. You got to pray through. Can I hear somebody? You got to pray through. You got to have your own prayer life. Because you can't depend on your best friend sometimes. Because they have their troubles too. They are sleepy. They are tired too. They're not thinking about you. You know the biggest lie I find on Facebook. Is when people say please pray for me. And you will see the response. I'm praying for you. Uh, that passes right away. It, whenever I answer somebody prayer. I say a prayer right there. Because I don't want to be. Uh, promising somebody I'm praying for you I'm not so have your own prayer life because they didn't help him pray a few things began to happen whether they had prayed or not but he would have gotten strength if they if they had prayed for him verse 38 and he began to be sorrowful and very heavy he could hardly walk now what happened? Two things will happen. In Gethsemane one and in Calvary the other. In Gethsemane, in the Old Testament, the high priest would lay his hands upon the goat chosen. And impute the sins of the people. He was known as the scapegoat. And the burden of the sins of Israel came upon the goat. They would throw him out in the wilderness. There's a long story there how he would end up in the thrown over a cliff. There were stations eight miles apart with booth and priests would take the goat and move from station to station until they dumped the goat out over a cliff. That's the scapegoat. This is what happened in Gethsemane. God laid his hands upon Jesus Christ and he who knew no sin. The perfect lamb, son of God, became sin. Not on the cross, here in Gethsemane, when God imputed his sins upon him. All sins upon him. He became sorrowful and heavy. He will carry that load unaided from there to the cross. He became known there as a man of sorrows and grief. And if you think he doesn't understand your sorrow and your grief, let me assure you, he knows it well. He's touched with the very feelings of our infirmities because he experienced everything that mankind can experience. He experienced it there. So he began to be sorrowful and very heavy. The burden of the world from Adam's time is now coming upon him and he's going to carry it and he cried my soul my soul is exceeding 
is sorrowful. Jesus never exaggerated the situation. He always spoke plain. He was not exaggerating. He was expressing the deep agony of Gethsemane. And he said, I feel like I'm going to die. You see, Satan wanted to kill him before he got to the cross. But Hebrews makes it clear that when he cried because he feared death, God saved him from dying there. And let me tell you, when, uh, where and when you're supposed to die, the devil can't make it happen before that. You might be in a car accident. You're not supposed to die. God is going to protect you even there. He protected Jesus when he should not have died and kept him alive until his purpose is finished. Hear what I'm saying? You're not going to die. You're going to live until your purpose in life is finished. Can somebody agree with me and say, I will live. I will not die. I have work to be to do yet for God. Hallelujah. They tarry here and watch me. This is the first round. They fell asleep. A privilege missed. And an honor forfeited. To, to be with the, the Messiah. By his side. To give him a shoulder to lean on. They missed it. Verse 39. And he went a little further. This is descriptive, child of God. He went a little further and fell on his face. Whether it was the Elijah praying posture or whether it was the weight of what he was carrying threw him down. He fell on his face and he didn't complain. He prayed. When life pushes you, and you smell dirt. And you breathe. Dirt. It's time to pray. I don't want to make the connection. But it's possible that when Satan was cursed. And he would crawl. He would eat the dust of the earth. Jesus was now going to kiss that dust. And turn it into holy ground somebody. And he prayed, oh, my father, if, this is the first if Jesus ever, Jesus ever uttered. This is the first time Jesus will repeat a prayer. He never did it before. Why? His soul was struggling with death. And he, the pure, pure, holy son of God, who never touched sin who never understood sin, is now feeling the chaos, the pressure, the agony, deceitfulness, the betrayal of sin weighing down on him. And he began to cry. Oh, my father. Later on, he will change his prayer from father to God when we get on the cross. Right now, his son praying to father. Father, you know, he knew. And he said it. With God, all things are possible. He said it. So he's trying this one on God. Father, you know you said. If it is possible. In the three times he prayed, God did not answer. And when you have prayed sincerely and settled the matter and God doesn't answer, go through it. Because God already told you what you were supposed to experience. You see, some people want a bed of roses and you will not always get a bed of roses in Christianity. It's not every day it's going to be a day of jubilance and joy. There are hard days to come. There are tough times we have to walk through. And when God did not give you an answer, go through it. You will meet him at the end of the journey. Hallelujah. And he will send angels to minister unto you. You're not alone. You're not alone. 
He went a little further. Can you go a little further? Can you go the second mile with Jesus? If you would take away this cup. Now, there are three cups in scripture, or four, maybe seven cups I read, but uh, regarding his life. This cup is different from the cup he just shared in the, uh, the celebration of the Passover. Same night. He's going to drink another cup now. This cup is the world's cup of iniquity. It is loaded with every bit of soul poisoning that there is. And soon he will be kissed by poison lips. And so he's going to drink this cup. And when he put it to his mouth and smell the stench of the world's iniquity, he reposed. Oh, I can't. I can't even bring this close to me. This is, this is so, so hard, Lord. Father didn't say anything because Father knew. And that's why he came. He knew that too. But it was so strange for him. It was, it was nothing he had ever experienced before. And he held the cup. He said, Father, please. If it's possible, move it away from me. But you know, Lord, nevertheless, nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. This is the crux of Christianity. I am going to emphasize. Thank you. I am going to emphasize that all spiritual matters must be settled in Gethsemane. You do not settle it on the cross. What is settled in Gethsemane is worked out on Calvary. You have to say here, not my will, but thy will be done. It is here you settle the matter. This is the place of absolute surrender. If you don't surrender here, you will never be victor here. People don't understand this. And you come to the order, I surrender. Fine, you don't understand what you're doing. Surrender is a military term. When the enemy shows up their hands, they surrender to a higher power. And here he is surrendering to a higher power in his sonship, to his father. And when you surrender, you don't get up and take up your surrender and walk away the same way you came. This must be settled or else you will never make progress. This will be a fake experience. Resurrection will be something you're thinking about. That's why the churches are weak. That's why the churches have no power because they, they misunderstand Gethsemane and fail to surrender their lives. Absolute surrender here. Settle it. Settle it. That's the second round. He came, found them sleeping. Verse 44, and he left them. Sometimes, even Jesus when he's weak, his presence is powerful. And when you don't pray, he may just walk away from you. He left them. He left them where they were. Sleep on, you sleepers. Yeah, that's a Jonah spirit. The boat is rocking. The storm is brewing. The people, the marinas are struggling to keep the boat afloat. Yes, young prophet is down in the basement. Sleeping. Sleeping. A sleeping church is a useless church. Paul says it's high time to arise. Arise from our sleep and slumber. I am admonishing this church to do more prayer meetings. I want more prayer meetings. I would love to see more people praying. 
Why? Because the power of God is the result of praying people. And the more we pray, is the more we will see the hand of God. The more we pray in the spirit, is the more release from heaven for us. Come on church, let us begin to pray. We have one sister brown there in that white hat there. She comes every Tuesday here and pray for one to two hours alone in this church, walking, touching every chair and praying. Thank you, sister brown. Raise your hand and let them see who I am talking about. Yes. We have a group that comes to pray before the service down in the back, about nine of them, led by Sister Beryl. Thank you for praying. We have a Wednesday night led by Pastor Jerry and, and Mick. Thank you guys and Pastor uh, Kimbrough, wife, Barbara. Thank you for praying. But we still need more prayer. I don't know how you measure it. But I measure it by prayer. Ian Bounds said it. Little prayer, little power. No prayer, no power. Much prayer, much power. Am I wrong to give you this advice? Am I wrong in asking you to pray more? Pray intensely more. Because the day is coming when you will need it. Build a habit of prayer. And the three times, silence was the only thing. He didn't hear from his father, but he knew his mission had to be fulfilled. So go on. Round two. Now he's coming to round three, and he went in again and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. It's not wrong to repeat what you have been saying. But if you repeat it, Long enough, and there is no answer coming. Know that God wants you to go through. You can't escape it. This is your destiny. Because, why? Stone guy, you got to keep your eyes on me. Because when I need you, thank you. I am emphasizing Gethsemane to the point of scripture. Three rounds. Three times he went in further and further and further. Gethsemane has death. And you cannot sit outside here and watch him pray alone. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses. A voice I hear falling on my ear. The Son of God And he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am not alone hallelujah as we, as we tarry there is none other ever known that voice you hear in Gethsemane you will never hear it anywhere else I conclude with what I open. Better be sanctified in our troubles than to be satisfied without them. You want to go up higher? You got to get in closer. May you make that decision of absolute surrender knowing that when you make this surrender, you are looking for trouble. You hear what I said? When you say, I will be done, oh Lord, you just ask for trouble. And we think that when we say that I will be done, only good things going to happen. But the will of God, from here on to here, is where Christians fail. This is the toughest part of the Christian life. Amen. Oh, we love miracles. We want to walk on water, multiply bread, fight devils, cast out demons. Wonderful. We come to the house. We bring our gold and our gifts and our tithes and offering. Wonderful. We had a beautiful manger experience. We saw the babe. Ah, all those things are good. You must have them. But you make no progress. You've done nothing until you 
settle it here. That you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. There is where you prove it. I am going to bless you with a prayer, but I want you to join with me, a prayer of surrender. Now that you understand that if you don't surrender in Gethsemane, anything else is shallow. It doesn't count because God has a progressive step and we are following the life of Christ. I want to pray with you. But I'm only praying for those who understand this and know what absolute surrender means. And that you are saying to God, Father, I don't want to escape. I want to go through with your will and your grace. And if you want my prayer, nobody looking around. Just stand to your feet. And this has to be a meaningful standing. I don't care what you do in your mind or think in your mind. That has nothing to do with me. I am going to pray for you. If you stand here and understand, Lord, I am surrendering today. Today we are making a covenant in Gethsemane. Today I am embracing your will for my life and I will walk soon to Calvary and it will be finished. I'm not even looking at who's standing. I'm, my head is bowed and my eyes are closed. It's between you and God. Father, I hold your sacred word in my heart as a witness that I have declared the counsel of God and get so many briefly to your people. And those that are standing are standing between you and them. I pray for them that they will understand what they're doing. And that this will be a one-time surrender, not an everyday thing. This is a now. One time, one time, one time act. An absolute surrender. Make it a prayer. Make it meaningful. Oh, Rabbi Shatta. <laughs> oh, God. I surrender all. I give you my all, everything. My past, my present, my future, my today, my now. I, I truly surrender. me now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen.